Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see everybody here on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, I say welcome to everyone here, family, friends, and those who are joining uh, via the stream at home. Welcome to you as well. I will go ahead and note to those um, worshiping from home or wherever you may be in the world today, as you can see, is communion or abroad. Have an opportunity to come and uh, be with us and, and sometimes preach and then share, um, particularly during our sharing time. And next week, we have one of those opportunities. Uh, we're very uh, fortunate to have Dave and Sue will be with us here next week, missionaries to South America. Um, and they will be uh, preaching and sharing some about their ministry uh, during this time, but they'll also be sharing more during our sharing time. So, of course, we always encourage if you're able to stay and be a part of our sharing time, but particularly when missionaries are here. Um, number one, it encourages them greatly uh, for, for us to, to be in there and learning more. Um, but even more so, it lets us uh, hear more about what God's doing through them in whatever part of the world they're in, and helps us to know specifically how we can be praying for them uh, throughout the year so we don't just support them financially, but even more importantly, uh, support them spiritually in prayer as well. So, so next Sunday, um, if, if you're able to stay for the sharing time, please do that, and then we'll just uh, give them a great big welcome. Um, some of you know them already as they come visit with us next week. All right, with that in mind, I invite everyone to stand, if you're able today, and join me in our call to worship. Today in our study in 1 Samuel, we're going to see some, uh, we're going to see some praising happening, and uh, we kick it off here with a great, a great psalm of praise today. Together we read, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate." They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Pray with me, please. Lord, I do thank you for this time we have together here this morning. I thank you for being able to come together, and, and it, does, it does my heart good, Lord, to, uh, to come and share this time with my brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, um, to see how you're working uh, in, in all of us, Lord, um, from our youngest to our oldest, Lord, uh, from Whatever we may be going through, God, um, we know some of what one another may be dealing with, other things we might not be aware of. But God, we come together with this common, common unity, this love for one another, this love that's made possible because of your great love for us. So Lord, I just pray today, God, that you, if the enemy wants to, to try to distract us this morning, to try to deceive us, to try to pull our hearts into, into places that, that are not where they need to be, God. But I pray that you would just protect us in those moments. God, I pray that you would just help us to stay focused on you, Lord, to listen to your voice, your voice alone, God, to be an encouragement to one another, God, and to receive the encouragement you have for each one of us. God, I pray that we would just be completely focused on you today, God, settled in on what you have for us here this morning, God. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
When reading through the chapter for this week, the part that really stood out the most to me was when the Lord told the Israelites how he had delivered them, and yet they still rejected him. He protects us, and he provides for us. He prepares the table for us and satisfies and sustains us, yet we so quickly turn to earthly things, only to find that they fall short. But God never falls short. May we not be like the Israelites. May we remember the one who created all things, and follow him only. May we not turn from our true king. Let's praise him now together.
we thank you for bringing us here today. May we praise you. May we worship you in spirit and truth. Please speak to our hearts today. Um, Please just guide us in your way and help us to seek you always. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Judges, in the sixth chapter, starting at the eleventh verse. The angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go, in this your strength, and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Gideon said to the angel, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Richard. Good morning once again, everyone. These doors wide open in the sunshine, it just makes me want to just like say, let's all go, it's like in class, you know, let's all have class outside today. Um, It's one of those sorts of beautiful days outside, so uh, we might have to keep that in mind, you know, a little outdoor on the hill teaching here. Um, If you have not already, if you have your copy of God's Word, please go ahead and, while I put this back together, uh, be turning in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Chapter 10 is where we find ourselves today. Grab a few Bible, grab a friend, or just listen along. And as we uh, get there today, and I hope we heard in the reminder of the story of Gideon that Richard was just reading, it sounds very familiar uh, as to how we heard Saul uh, respond to to what Samuel had to say to him um, the last time we looked at chapter 9, and we'll hear more overtones of that that today. Um, so our one big idea for today is this. It's we have the power because we have his presence. We have the power because we have his presence. Pray with me, please. Lord, I do thank you again for this gorgeous day, God. And God, we just thank you that you are the Lord of creation and the heavens declare the glory of God. So, God, I pray that we would declare your glory as we intentionally draw ourselves close to you today, God. As we look into your word, I pray that we would find there exactly what it is you want us to find, Lord. Um, God, that you would take these words here today, Lord, that, that, that I have to offer, Lord, that you would use those in whatever way you have ordained, God, and that your spirit, most importantly, Lord, would speak to each one of us, God, in ways that, that I might not even have thought of, Lord, but that your spirit would take your word today, God, and that, it would, that he would magnify it within us, Lord, so that we would know, God, what you desire of us, God, so that we would hear your words of encouragement and that we would hear your words of challenge where we need it to, Lord. God, so bless us, bless our kids downstairs as they interact with your word in their own unique way. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So our first truth this morning is this, it's we can be certain that God is with us. So we pick back up where we left off last time in chapter 10, verse 1 of, of 1 Samuel, where there we read this, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him saying, has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelza on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to worship God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets going, coming, coming down from the high place with lyres, timbrels, pipes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them. And you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hands find to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. So the story picks back up where we left off last week. And last week, we saw um, where, where Saul and his servant had been doing this search for the, the lost donkeys of Saul's father. And it's a search that led them to seek wisdom and guidance from Samuel, the man of God. They said, there's a man of God nearby, and he will help, help us know the direction we are to go. And Samuel was prepared for their visit, you may remember, because God had made known to him that, that, Saul, that Saul was coming and he was going to be the one who would be the first king of Israel, all right, in response to how the people had been demanding that they have a king to lead them. And Samuel told Saul to, to send the servant on. That's where we left the story last week. They got up in the morning and, and Samuel told Saul, tell your servant to go on ahead of you so we can have a little chat, just the two of us. And that's where the story picks up today. And, you know, Samuel breaks out the, the olive oil and starts pouring it on his head and, and giving him this, this, you know, just thing that must have been really hard for Saul to comprehend in that moment. Okay, imagine how Saul must have felt, okay? It, was, it was, wasn't enough, you know, that the day before he found himself at this special dinner that had apparently been laid out just for him with a special portion, but now this too. Saul's search for some lost donkeys had led him to find a kingdom instead. The act of anointing. Uh, the, the pouring the oil on the head and as, as Samuel did this to Saul. This was a well-known um, uh, 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 tradition, celebration, ceremony uh, to the Israelites as that is how the priests were set apart. They were anointed. And that was something that, that Moses had given from God instructions earlier in the Old Testament. And this act of anointing and what people would have known it meant because of the priest, it, it meant you were being set apart. Right? That was what it boiled down to. You were being set apart. And here Saul was set apart, given a, a special assignment to be the ruler over the Israelites. And as believers, we have the joy of being set apart. Right? Consider the famous Ephesians 1.4, what it says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. All right, so he set us apart, okay, from before time began. That verse goes on to say, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. 
the joy in being set apart. We have this, this tremendous grace and love and blessing that's been lavished on us, been poured out on us, right? Better than any olive oil being poured out on us. And so God, in his grace and his wisdom and, and his good plan, he has set us apart as, to salvation. He has called us to himself. He has beckoned us, invited us to come and to follow him. Now, along with the, the joy of being set apart, right, and there is great joy in being set apart for God, there is also a great responsibility in, in being set apart, okay? 1 Peter 2.9 puts it well. Peter writes, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Right here we hear the language of being set apart. A holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into wonderful light. Okay? So God set us apart, and then we have this responsibility. What are we to do with this? We're to declare his praises. We're to declare the praises of the one who set us apart, who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And so Saul would feel, he would feel the responsibility of being set apart, particularly as he was first called to be the deliverer of the people from the Philistines, their their oppressive, ongoing foe. And we'll see in the weeks ahead um, the battles that, that happen that Saul is called to be set apart to lead the people into. So we are set apart to live differently than the world around us. We're set apart to live differently than the world around us. We're set apart as salt and light, as Jesus would say, to shine the truth and the hope of God, to flavor the world with, with a taste that invites others to, to, to come and see, right? To see, to taste and see, to come and see that the Lord is good, that the Lord is the best. And so while we want to discern what God is calling us to, and I think we, we, we talk about this a lot, right? Like, what is God calling me to? What does God have for me? What is, what is the, the path he has, you know? And I say particularly when, when we're younger, you know, and we're trying to figure that out as teenagers, but all throughout our life, we're always trying to discern, what, is, what does God have for me? What does God have for my children? What does God have for, for our family? What is it that God is calling us to do? And, and we should do that. We should figure out what is, you know, what is God calling us to, whether it's a job or a school or, or whatever it may be. Within that, the, the overarching umbrella, if you will, under which all of this operates, under which everything operates, no matter what we are doing, no matter where we are going, is simply this. We are called. We are set apart to do what? To glorify God to enjoy his goodness and his mercy and to help others see his truth and his beauty. And that's the wonderful thing. We can do those things no matter what it is we are doing, no matter what job it is we are doing, no matter where we may be living, no matter what the circumstances of our life to do, we can try to figure out what is it you specifically want me to do, but God, within whatever it is you want me to do, My overarching thing is going to be, I am set apart to glorify you. I'm set apart to enjoy your goodness and your mercy. And I'm set apart to help others see your beauty and your truth. And I can do that wherever, whenever, however you want me to do. When we think like that, it puts a bigger perspective. um, Because sometimes we we get caught in the minutia of like, God, exactly what am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing the right thing? Am I walking the right path? And that's a good question to ask. I'm not saying we don't ask that question. But say, God, as I'm trying to figure it all out, I'm going to remember the bigger picture. The bigger picture of it's about you. It's about enjoying you. It's about helping others to enjoy you, to glorify you in all things, to be obedient to you in all things. Notice here Samuel said to Saul, he said that Saul was anointed to rule over God's inheritance, all right? The bottom line was, Samuel was saying, God is the owner, right? It's God's inheritance, and what God's calling you to do is to play a part in overseeing that, right? To play a part in, in ruling over that. 
he would, Saul would be what we would call the steward, all right? the steward of the house, all right? the one who is in charge of carrying out the master's orders and the master's good wishes. So it leads us to our question is, how are we doing with overseeing, stewarding? How are we doing with managing whatever opportunities God gives us, whatever influence he gives us, and whatever he has called us to do? How are we doing with, with, with managing that? And is it all being done in the sense and the reality and the truth of 1 Corinthians 10.31, where we're told, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So we praise him. We, we point others to him. So in this section here, we have seen God be, he's, he's, he's being so gracious with Saul. And that's why this story reminds me of Gideon's story. As we, that's why we had us read Gideon to start with. Because you may remember in Gideon's story, God was pretty patient with Gideon. Gideon was like, is this, are you, really? Do you really want me to do this, God? Can I, can I put this like blanket out and, and you make it wet and the rest of the ground dry? And God's like, okay. And the next morning he's like, all right, God, that was really great. But, but now can you, can you reverse it? All right, okay. And I'll, if it had been me, I'd have been like, Gideon, get it together, all right, okay. But God's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that too, all right. And I see that same sort of thing here, all right. God, speaking through Samuel, gives Saul this, like, here's three things that you're going to see happening, all right? When you go out today, these three very specific things are going to happen, and it's God's grace, because all three of these signs would happen, and they all would be for the purpose of confirming to him that God was with him, and that God was calling him to do exactly what he was hearing. God made it obvious that he was working. To Saul, right? Saul, he couldn't deny it. God made it very clear to him what he was doing. But I also see in this same part of our passage, this ending command that Samuel gives to Saul. That's like, after all that, you're going to go to Gilgal, all right? And we're going to get there in a few weeks. You're going to go to Gilgal, but you're going to wait. You're going to wait seven days for me to come and to do something, all right? And I think, I think that's important. Because that is a call to be patient, for Saul to be patient as God's plan continues to unfold. Right? I hope you see where I'm going here. There will be times where, where God makes it very clear to us. Right? Where it's like, okay, God, I, like, I, I, I get it. I get the message, right? I, it's, it's, you're making it clear. There will be times where God makes it very clear to us what we are to do. But there will also be times where we're told to wait, to be still, to be patient, and to trust as God's plan unfolds. I'm not saying that means we like just say, like, don't give any thought to it, all right? We're still like seeking God, drawing near to God, but sometimes he's going to make it very clear, and sometimes he's going to say, wait seven days until I come and unfold the rest of the plan, or seven months, or seven years, you know? And we're faithful in all of it. When we are uncertain, right, in those moments as we're waiting for God's plan to unfold, we're waiting to see what's next. When we are uncertain of things, and this applies to, to lots of our spiritual walk, when we are uncertain, we live into what we are certain of, right? Because the truth is, we have enough. We have enough already. Of, of God's word, we have enough in God's word that he has clearly told us to do that if we just focus on those things, we would have more than enough to live abundant life. We would have more than enough to be obedient to God. We would have more than enough to walk in God's ways. And so we might be tempted, and by we, I mean mainly me, we might be tempted to say, God, what's next? All right, what's next? Okay, show me more. I want to know what's next. I'm not being very patient right now. And I can imagine God saying, be patient. Focus on what I've already revealed to you. Focus on what I've already revealed to you. Yes, keep seeking, keep, keep pursuing, keep drawing near, but focus on what I've already revealed to you. Because I don't know about the rest of y'all, but I still have plenty of work to do with the simple things like kindness, and compassion, and mercy, 
and forgiveness. I've got plenty of work to do on what God's already made abundantly clear to me. All right? I'm going to keep seeking what else he has for me, but I've got to keep working on those things in the midst of it all. The three signs that God gave here to Saul, they would be an encouragement for him to live into the kingly task at hand because he could believe that great promise here in verse 7 where he's told, for God is with you. And today we have that same great promise that God is with us. And we can be certain that God is faithful to his promises And as we really, really, really live into the truth that God is powerfully with us, and I say that because so often I'm like, I say God is with us, and then I find myself like getting like, how did this just happen? Like, how did I get to this place, right? right, God, did I forget that you were with me and helping me? I'm like, you know, I didn't need to respond the way I just did to that person because you're with me, but I wasn't acting like it in that moment, Lord. But as we really live into that, it sets us free. It sets us free to live into his purposes. It sets us free to be his hands and his feet in the world around us. And it sets us free to not be overwhelmed and overcome because God is with us. Our next truth today is this. It's we can declare our heavenly father's truth. Look at verse 9. So as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. And when all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul replied, he assured us that the donkeys had been found. But he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. So here, as we see this this fulfillment of the promise of of the Holy Spirit of God coming onto Saul in power, we we need to be careful with Saul's story and make an important distinction here. Okay, The Holy Spirit empowering is different in the Old Testament than our understanding, the way we think about it today as New Testament, Jesus believers living on this side of the cross and the empty tomb. Because here what we have is an Old Testament example of how the Holy Spirit empowered specific people for specific tasks at specific times. We, we see that all throughout the book of Judges. All right? Another reason we had Gideon's reminder story of where God would raise somebody up and the Spirit would come on them in power to go out and do a very specific task. And that's, what, that's what's happening here, here with Saul. And this is different, okay? This is different. And, I, and I'm making this difference because as we see Saul's story unfold over the weeks ahead, we're going to be like saying, but wait a second, I thought he had the Spirit of God on him, and now he's not living like that. And, and did he have the Spirit? You know, we want to put it in New Testament perspective. You know, was he saved? Did he lose his salvation? Did it go back and forth? And as New Testament believers, we understand that we don't, that we don't lose our salvation, that the Holy Spirit comes, and as we are truly, truly saved, as we uh, declare, ask for forgiveness, we declare God, Jesus, to be our leader, the Lord and Savior of our life. We dedicate our life to him, all right? It's not something that we're going to keep going back and forth on. We're just going to keep living in the truth that he's already done with us, all right? Now, if our, the entirety of our entire whole life doesn't testify to what our mouth said, then we might have to ask the question, all right, am I really saved? But that's a whole different thing. But it's an important distinction to make here. Right? Because as New Testament believers, we understand that the Holy Spirit comes to have a permanent residence in our lives, a permanent place in the life of a believer. 
One who has called on Jesus as Savior and Lord in truth. For us, the whole process begins by God doing a work in us that only he can do. Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God does this work in us to make us soft as he calls us to himself to be receptive, a call we can then respond to. So then when we ask forgiveness of our sins, when we, when we call on Jesus as the Lord, the leader of our lives, we are gifted with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, which is another mark of our being different, our being set apart from the world around us. But the parallel here, okay, I talked about the differences here, but the parallel here is just as Saul was empowered to live differently because of the empowering of the Holy Spirit in his life at that time, we too, because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, we can live differently. That's the only way we can, right? It's only because of, of not, you know, not by might or by power, but what? By the Spirit of God living within me. And because of that, we can live differently. We can act differently. We can think differently. We can speak differently. We can handle our problems and our woes differently. We can experience the transforming power of God in our lives and then faithfully walk in that truth the rest of our lives. Yes, there will be stumbles along the way. There will be struggles. There will be times of battles with temptation. There will be times of momentary falling, of blowing it big time. But that doesn't mean we've lost our salvation. Our story does not end there because we have that heart that God has given us. We have that new transformed heart for God. And so we get back up and we stay God focused and we continue walking with him. We seek for God to continually to shape us, to mold us, to refine us, to transform us to conform us more and more to his image. It's a lifelong process. Isaiah 64, 8. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. You know, there's a saying that says God qualifies the called. You know, the idea that like, you know, God he, he calls us to do something, and, and then he, he equips us for going out and doing that. And here, God called Saul to be the king, and then he qualified him by promising, I will be with you. And the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our life is what qualifies us to be the people that God wants us to be. A, a prayer I often pray is that I will be, I say, God, I just want to be, I want to be the husband you want me to be. I want to be the father you want me to be, the son you want me to be, the, the, the pastor you want me to be, the friend you want me to be. Whatever it is, God, I want to be the person that you want me to be. And I can only do that. I can only do that as I live into the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. We can only do that, all right, as we live into the power of of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. As we abide with Jesus, as we stay connected to him, pursuing him, and we let the fruit of the Holy Spirit be experienced in our life. Right? We stay connected, he grows the fruit in our life. And as we do that, it gives us a story to tell, and it gives us a reason to praise, which leads us to this, this group of prophets that came down and that Saul encountered you know, I wonder, what was this scene? What did it look like? I said, Saul started prophesying. Right? What, what did that look like? Was it uh, ecstatic and enthusiastic shouts of praise? Was it a proclamation of passionately and powerfully speaking God's revealed truth? And I think the answer is it was probably both. Right? It's probably both things happening in that moment. Obviously, these prophets praised God musically as they came down armed with, you know, tambourines and instruments and all sorts of things like that. 
But as we think about prophesying, the majority of when it says somebody is, is, was prophesying or a prophet was speaking, the majority of what we see in the Bible is that person simply repeating the truths of God that God has already revealed, right? And like repeating it over and over and over again. Like this is what God has said, all right? And I'm, just, and I'm declaring that truth. I'm reminding us of that truth. And that is, that is how we see prophecy particularly happening. And so as Saul, as Saul did this, as he was praising God, as he was declaring the truths of God, right, we, we know that he had to be close to home because people recognized him here. And the people that knew him saw him and they said, something's different, all right? Different's our big word today if we haven't picked up on that one yet, okay? They said, something's different here. I don't know. Something's going on. What's going on with old Saul over here? Because God's presence in our life it makes a mark. God's presence in, our, presence in our life leaves a mark on us. And, and, and with this, as we, as we contemplate God's presence and the mark it leaves on us, sometimes we'll be called to times of, of quiet contemplation. Like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and we read at the birth of Jesus, tells us multiple times that she treasured all of these things and pondered on them in her heart. There'll be times that that's, that's what, where we're at with things. There'll also be times for jubilant praise when we're ready to just lift hands to God and just sing his praises and declare his wonders. But in all of it, the heart of the message, the truth of God, the life he calls each one of us to, that is the reason for our praise. And that is the hope that others need to hear about as well. So in all of this newfound joy, the question next is, why did Saul not tell his uncle about what had happened? Like, that seemed like an important thing, right? His uncle's like, so, what did old Samuel tell you about, all right? He's always got something good to say. Well, he told us where the donkeys were, and he made me the king of Israel. What? <laughs> I mean, like, that would be like, kind of like a hard thing to say, I'm sure. Was Saul still struggling with believing it, what just happened? Did it seem impossible to him? Had it been a dream? Am I ready for this? God must have made a mistake in choosing me to do this. I think we can all struggle with believing what God has promised for each one of us, what God has declared to be true about each one of us. It's easy to believe a negative narrative about yourself, especially when we mess up, especially when we blow it big time. But that is not God's narrative for our life. We need to believe, we need to embrace, and we need to live into what God has declared true about each one of these. All right? And, 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 and like I often like to say, as I was writing these words, all right? And like, this always happens. Like, I don't make this stuff up. I don't embellish it. I'm like, this God's declaring this truth about us. And the lyric that, deploy, that was playing in my ear in that very moment was this. It said, I'll never be more loved than I am right now. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. God, God, God he, his love for us is complete. All right? And it's not like we have to, like, I got to do one more thing in order to get his love to me to the next level. His love for us is complete. That's the end of the story. As believers, as children of God, we are loved with an unfailing, faithful love. So do we struggle to believe that God's love for us doesn't waver when we stumble or when we fail with a temptation? When we speak a word of anger. And no, we don't want to simply excuse our sin. We want to deal with it in those moments. But as we do, we do not need to wonder about how God sees us because his love is unfailing and unwavering, and that is a truth to be celebrated. Our final truth quickly this morning is this. It's never forget where our true hope comes from. Look at verse 17. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, 
who saves you all out of your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. And when Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. Right? So this is through the, 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 the supernatural stewardship of God, working through uh, their casting of lots. It, it all came down to like, it's gotten funneled down now to Saul. Right? Saul's the one who's been called to be king. Everybody knows it now. Right? And the story continues from there. Finally, Saul's son of Kish was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. All right? Talk about just getting called out, right? Like straight up called out, right? He's over there hiding, all right? Go find him. All right? You cannot win at hide and seek with God, all right? It just doesn't work, okay? And that's a whole nother sermon in and above itself. They ran and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he, had, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose heart God had touched. But some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. So if we've, as we've noted before, there's a tension, there's a tension between the declaration that, that the people have rejected God and they're calling for a king, and in the provision that hundreds of years earlier in Deuteronomy, God had given instructions for what this future king is supposed to to be like, right? But the disconnect, as we've talked about before, it came in the people wanting to have a king like all the other nations. We don't want to be different, all right? We want to be like all the other nations. A king who would lead them in their battles, but God was their leader. God was their deliverer, as he reminds them of here. But somehow, they were not satisfied with that. Or his timing for when he would give them the king that he chose. It didn't match their timelines and their expectations. And so this strikes me here, this scene where Samuel, he declares, he declares to them, he says, you have given up on God as your king. And remember, he's the one who faithfully has gone out before you and delivered you and set you free. Instead, you have chosen a man who is now hiding from you. You have chosen second best, right? And that's not, I'm not trying to disparage Saul, right? Anything is second best to God. But he's like, you have God who's going out and fought all your battles, and now you've chosen the man who is hiding, okay? You've chosen second best, so the reminder to us is let's not choose second best in our lives, which is what we do anytime we don't keep God as the focus of our life, anytime he's not the guide of our life, anytime he's not the hope of our life, anytime we do it our way instead of doing it God's way. But I don't want to be unduly hard on Saul at this point, okay? He could have been hiding because he was still in shock at what was going on, all right? Okay, you know, all, all us introverts out there, that might have been a lot for him to take in at that moment, all right? We might have found ourselves in the same place. Maybe he wasn't so much hiding not to be found because he just, but he was hiding because he needed a moment, all right? He needed a moment to take it all in. And in humility, he could have been asking again, how can I do this? And that might be a question we often find ourselves asking of ourselves. Lord, how can I do, insert here, whatever this is in your life? 
And that is when we need to be like another future king of Israel, like Solomon, who God said, Solomon, ask me anything you want, anything you want, and it's yours, okay? And according to 1 Kings 3, 9, Solomon simply asked for a discerning heart in order to lead others well and to know the difference between right and wrong. Solomon wanted godly wisdom. And that must be our answer every time we ask the question, how can I do this, Lord? How can I do this? Because God's wisdom and God's heart is what we need. Whether our struggle is with an attitude of, how can I do this? Or perhaps it's sometimes with an attitude of, God, I don't want to do this. That's something I have to remind myself of at times. In the midst of all of this, I love how God made it obvious that, that he was present at the coronation event, right? Saul might not have liked it, but, but, but I love here, he just spoke out. He spoke out loud. Like, where is Saul? He's over there. All right, okay. It's very clear that God is here in this moment. If only we could live with the peace of knowing for sure, as we've talked about earlier, that God is with us. All right? in every single thing we do. We might not hear that audible voice, but we can know that he is with us. Right? And now, yes, this might cause us some angst when we know that God is not pleased in that present moment if I'm in the middle of an ugly attitude or something like that. But the positive of knowing, yes, that God is audience to my coming and my goings, that he cares deeply about the details of my life should be of great comfort and great reassurance to all of us. And as God revealed how he was going to work here, some of those present scoundrels, it says, they had their doubts. How is this Saul going to save us? Right? But were they really doubting Saul or were they doubting what God said he was going to do? God said, this is, this is, this is the one I've sent. So who were they really doubting in that moment? Do we ever doubt God's provision, his ability, his concern, his love? Finally, I love here that as Saul left, he didn't go away alone. And like Saul, we need community. We need to be surrounded by godly men and women, as it says here, whose hearts have been transformed by God. We need each other because there will be people who want to like drag us down, maybe not intentionally, but people that just want you know, to drag us down who are not encouraging, right? who may verbally assault us as Saul was at that time. But I love the fact that it says Saul went away silent. I don't see him going away silent in fear, but perhaps in wisdom, all right? Because Proverbs 29, 11 tells us, fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. That same proverb also tells us, do you see someone who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for them. And I love verse 22 in that proverb. It says, an angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. It's a reminder that the way we need to respond and the way we need to speak to one another is in Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, <clears throat> but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So in that moment, in choosing to not respond, Saul was choosing to live differently. So may that be the theme of our lives. Let's live differently by being completely empowered by God's presence by being completely empowered by God's truth, by being completely empowered by God's great love for us. Pray with me, please. Lord, again, we thank you for just your rich word, God. And it's, it, there, there's a lot here, Lord, and, and, and there's just so much more, God. It's just, it's just the depths of your word. We, just, we can never plumb to the bottom, God. And so, God, we just keep digging, and we just keep seeking, and we just keep uh, just, just being empowered by your truth, Lord. So, God, I know 
There is a, a ton of things to consider today, Lord. But God, whatever that one thing is, for every person in this room, for every person at home, whatever that one thing is that you have, especially for each one of us today, God, may that be what we hear. May that be what we take away. May that be what we contemplate and reflect on as we remember in the midst of it all, whether you're challenging us or comforting us, that you are with us, that you are for us, and that you give us everything we need to live differently for your glory, for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us. We are going to sing Jesus Messiah and declare the truth of the great love that God provided for us in so many ways, but especially through his son, Jesus Christ.
We prepare to come to our communion table now. Let us say together what we affirm found in the Apostles' Creed in your bulletin. Together we read this. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to the table, we, let us remind ourselves of the words of Jesus who, who said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And few of us, in fact, none of us, can claim to perfectly live up to such a standard. And the Apostle Paul therefore urges us to examine ourselves carefully before taking the Lord's Supper to remember the ways that we have offended God by what we have either done or left undone in thought, word, or deed, to confess our sins before Him, forgiving those who have offended us so that we ourselves may be forgiven. And then being bonded together in unity, we come to this table with gratitude and a clean heart. So let's let's take a moment to just uh, to to talk with God, um, to get with God, and just ask the Holy Spirit to shine the light on anything in our lives um, that we need to confess to God and ask for His forgiveness for. Lord, in your word, you have said this is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the perfect offering for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So may we cling to these promises and carry ourselves in light of them throughout the coming days. Amen. As we prepare to come to the table today to receive communion, remember the Lord's Last Supper, we are reminded that this is an invitation for believers, for those who have experienced the work that Christ made possible on the cross and the empty tomb. So all are invited to take part who have confessed their sins, who have asked forgiveness, who have called on Jesus to be the Savior of their lives. And today, as we take this, I just invite us. The theme of it is is remember. We hear Jesus say this multiple times in his words to his disciples. So may we remember what Jesus has done for us. But also, let's take ourselves to that night 
in the upper room when the disciples had no idea what was coming. The words Jesus had just spoken to them was, I will not leave you as orphans, right? but I will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. So may we remember what Christ has done for us in these moments, but may we also remember because of what he has done for us that we have the promise that he is with us now. It's not just about a work that he's already done, but it's about what he's doing right now and will continue to do because of the promise that he is with us. So our Lord Jesus, on the night on which he was betrayed, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Lord, may we be amazed at the sacrifice of your own body, which was broken to redeem sinners. Lord, may we always be amazed at the sacrifice of your own body, which was broken to redeem sinners. Jesus gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Lord, may we ever be mindful of the blood you shed for us, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And as a reminder, the gold is juice, and the purple is wine.
When he had given thanks, Jesus gave the cup to them, saying, Drink you all of this, for this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. And after supper, they sang a hymn and went out. Let's stand together and sing, You Are My Vision.
So I'm glad that on a day when we had uh, the uh, band of prophets coming down with their tambourines that we found a way to get some tambourines included in the music today. Anytime I read this story from now on, in my mind, this is the song Saul was singing that day um, with the other prophets. So thank you all so much. Um, as a reminder, uh, it's, it's time to eat. So uh, in a few moments, um, hang around if you're able to and uh, have some brunch, some fellowship time as we sit with each other and share with each other. Then, of course, if you're able, I would encourage you to stay for the sharing time um, and just be a part of, of that testimony time, that prayer time, that praise time as well. I leave us today as we've thought about this idea of being empowered to live different. Very famous Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where we're told, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's go and live different this week for his glory, for our good. Blessings. Bye.